If the small town escape room you signed up for turned out to be inescapable and your safe word didn't work, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made by the escapists, what they should have done differently, and how to beat the inventor in No Escape Room. The theme of this escape room is that this is the home of a man called the inventor, who spent his life trying to communicate with the dead through various contraptions, drugs, and human test subjects. After they get locked inside, they soon find out this isn't a theme, and the inventor needs more human test subjects. Let's find out if we can escape what wasn't meant to be escapable. Before we get to it, I'm looking for a nerd who can help me make grotesque thumbnails that will almost get me blocked on YouTube. If you're interested, click my link in the description. Things aren't going well for Michael. He had made plans for a day of horseback riding with his teenage daughter Karen, but the backcountry ranch was closed when they arrived. Now, instead of forging fond family memories, they're broken down on a secluded stretch of highway out in the middle of nowhere. Rather than help out under the hood, Karen pulls the typical I'm too cool for my parents routine and stays glued to her phone while blasting music. She's so committed to shutting out her father that she nearly walks in front of a passing tow truck without even noticing. The car trouble proves to be more than Michael can handle, and the two wind up at a nearby diner while the repair shop works to get them back on the road. Determined to salvage the one weekend he gets with his daughter for the month, Michael flips through a local newspaper in search of an activity they can both enjoy. Movies, mini golf, and bowling all fail to meet Karen's strict standards of amusement. But then Michael lands on an ad for an escape room. Despite his daughter's concern that it might be run out of some weirdo's garage, Michael commits to the activity on the spot, summoning a nearby waitress to ask for directions. The waitress's cheerful disposition gives way to an expression of concern. She warns them not to go, claiming that a lot of bad things have happened there over the years, and visitors are often never heard from again. She then busts out laughing and apologizes for screwing with them. The waitress explains that they're in for a hell of a time, and then casually walks off without actually providing any directions. Karen visits the bathroom before they head out. As she stands alone at the sink, a single bulb lighting the dingy lavatory begins to flicker, sending a chill up her spine. She hears a coin drop in one of the stalls and turns to investigate, but before she can discover the source of the noise, Betsy comes barging out of an adjacent stall and nearly door checks her. The waitress apologizes for the scare and then barely wets her hand before going back to handle people's food. Still a little weirded out by the strange sounds, Karen returns to the sink and collects her belongings. Obviously, training your kid to come around to the side of the car furthest from the road should have started before her age. Karen's lucky both her daddy and the tow truck driver were paying attention, otherwise this movie would have been a hell of a lot shorter. Michael's not all on the ball either. Why would you just drive out to a remote horse ranch without at least calling ahead to make sure they'll be open when you get there? Rural areas are often home to far more activities than people give them credit for, but escape rooms typically aren't among them. Both Michael and Karen have a smartphone with service. They can go on Groupon or Yelp to find something to do at a reputable place. Had they used their phones like normal people, they likely would have landed on a safe, well-reviewed activity, instead of the hellhole they're about to wander into. Now that our plans have changed, we should immediately notify our friends and or loved ones to let them know exactly what we'll be doing and where. You know, basic common sense stuff. I'm not sure why it would be necessary to check out a bathroom stall over the sound of falling pocket change, but she should leave immediately if she feels unsafe. If she wants to investigate, she should just bend down and glance under the stall doors to see if anyone's there, instead of creeping closer to the door, putting her in range of being grabbed or hit by the door when it opens. As we find out later, there is a person creeping in the bathroom, and it's Karen. What this means, and what would happen if she opened the door, I'm not too sure. Confused? You might want to strap in. We might be able to escape the no escape room, but we won't be able to escape the biggest, baddest, and scariest new boss that this video's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, added this month, the Hydra. Raid has over 600 champions that come from unique factions, each with their own history in the world of Tolaria. I really like that you can test out different champion team mixes to alter your strategies and playstyles, like including different support champions. Fight battles, collect champions, and grow your clan using my link below or QR code to download Raid to your mobile phone or PC. There's a ton going on with Raid this month. The Hydra is a super-powered clan boss with multiple different heads, and each head has unique mechanics. It can share the pain and push damage from itself onto your team. It can scare your champions, rot them from the inside and cloak itself in a cloud of poison. If the newest boss isn't enough, Raid's giving away a super limited edition champion to every player in the game, new and old. It's esports legend and Navi superstar Simple. Get Simple's limited edition champ for free by logging in for 7 days between now and January 28th. Raid's also releasing awesome new champions, along with a brand new faction wars crypt for the faction The Shadowkin. There's a ton of events and tournaments including a special fusion event where you can get one of Raid's newest 
legendary champions. Download Raid by using my link in the description or scan my QR code to get some free resources and a free mystery champion right away. All the treasure will be waiting for you here, and rewards will be available only for the next 30 days and only for new players. A cab drops Michael and Karen off at a large house out in the country. The place seems deserted, but Michael is certain this is where the escape room is. A few hard knocks yield no response at first, but then the door swings open, seemingly by itself. Upon walking inside, there's no sign of anyone around, until a woman suddenly materializes behind Karen's back and grabs her by the arms, demanding to know how they got inside and what they're after. Michael rushes to intervene, but the encounter is quickly revealed to be just part of the act. The strange woman, Josie, says that the others are waiting, and then leads them down the hall. Deeper inside the home, Michael and Karen meet up with the three other participants. Birthday girl Melanie, her phone-addicted boyfriend Tyler, and Fifth Wheel Chad, I mean Andrew. Melanie claims to be an avid escapist, but it seems like her boyfriend only came along to get out of buying her a present. Andrew then dryly jokes about being a secret plant working for the owners, likely to deflect from the fact that he's the kind of weirdo that goes to an escape room by himself. Josie walks in carrying a tray of bubbling teacups. She explains that few visitors have dared to come since the disappearances before distributing the cups amongst her guests. Karen goes to take a sip of the concoction, but Michael stops her, pointing out that she doesn't even know what it is. Melanie, on the other hand, eagerly slurps the stuff down, loosely identifying it as chai tea. Josie then passes out a round of waivers for everyone to sign without actually reading and begins collecting their cell phones. With all participants ready to play, she closes the heavy metal storm shutters on all the windows and wheels out an antique film projector. As the silver screen flickers with disturbing images of disfigured corpses and grotesque medical experiments, Josie lays out a backstory to the escape room scenario. She explains that the local population was once plagued by bizarre and nightmarish visions of unknown origin. Doctors feared it to be an epidemic of mental illness, while the church placed the blame on satanic intervention. Ultimately, the source of this mysterious affliction was determined to be this very house. According to Josie's story, the property belonged to a reclusive inventor who moved out into the country to conduct experiments society wouldn't approve of. The town sent five people to investigate the inventor's home and put a stop to his activities, but none of them were ever seen again. Now, it's up to the five participants to find the missing townsfolk and to help them escape. Each of the escape rooms will contain a key to let them progress through the house. They have an hour to complete their task, but can leave the game at any time by saying the word awake. The film strip reaches its end, leaving the room pitch black. Melanie turns on a nearby lamp to reveal that Josie has disappeared. There are red flags popping off everywhere that should make us reconsider getting locked up in this person's basement. Firstly, the metal bars installed over the interior of the back windows in the main entryway. This is at minimum a fire hazard, and wholly unnecessary for an escape room designed to rely on their wits. Secondly, the fact that Karen was grabbed by the receptionist. Laws about touching somebody during an activity are pretty complicated. However, it's generally frowned upon, especially before signing a waiver. Thirdly, lack of payment requested up front. There's no free lunch, or chai tea, and you're going to be paying somehow. It's usually best to not leave the terms of compensation vague and mysterious. I'm not saying the escape room operators will try to ransom you, but they might, and that's the best worst case. When it comes to the complimentary drinks, the steam could be explained away as dry ice added for the thematic effect, but yeah, I'm not going to be drinking that potentially laced tea, and I'm sure as hell not going to be giving up my phone. Risk of theft aside, something serious could happen that warrants a call to 911. I would just tell the hostess I left my phone in the car, or that I'm a Luddite and cell phones are the devil. Unless she's willing to strip search me, that should be all it takes to keep it. At minimum, a last text should be sent to your loved ones, letting them know where you are, what you're doing, and when you'll be back to check in with them. You'll probably be dead by the time they notice you're missing, but in the event your captor likes to toy with you for a while, they might be able to get a rescue team to you in time. Escape room contracts are usually longer than a single page, and important legal and health information would be in plain text to protect the company from liability. Cutesy, period accurate contracts are fine so long as you can read them, but if it's an illegible scrawl, no one should be signing this to make sure they don't wind up getting sewn to a human senti pad. Even though these escape rooms typically rely on wit and puzzle solving, it's always a good idea to be paying attention to how they lock you in, where they go, and how you can brute force your way out if the puzzle box stops working and nobody responds to your safe word. The shutters across the windows are operated by some sort of mechanical pulley system. This suggests that, at least in this room, the group might be able to use leverage to lift the plates off the unbarred windows or wind the gears in reverse to lift the plates. Still a little shaken up from story time, the group make their way to the first 
worst of the escape rooms. It's a dusty old study lit up just barely enough to see. The door behind them swings shut with the mechanical clanking of turning gears. They're locked in. A buzzer then sounds on a nearby clock, showing 60 minutes remaining. With the game underway, the group begins searching the ancient clutter for anything that looks out of place. Almost immediately, Karen comes across some bottles labeled which Andrew explains is a powerful hallucinogenic used by South American shamans to communicate with the beyond. A bit more searching turns up an old vinyl album by Ma Kettle and the Jug Boys. At first, it seems like a red herring, but Karen and Andrew spin it up on a nearby gramophone anyways. The music is terrible, but Melanie quickly connects the words of the song to the various symbols adorning a series of tribal masks hanging on the wall. After rearranging the masks according to the lyrics, a painting swings open to reveal a hidden safe. While every Everyone else sets out to find the combination, Tyler takes one of the masks off the wall and gazes through the eye slots. He looks down at his hand to find worms crawling around under his skin. Tyler then aims the mask at Melanie and sees a shadowy figure walking right beside her. Terrified, he calls her name and scares the crap out of her. Everyone looks at him like he's crazy, but he insists that he saw something in the room with them. After talking down the frightened Tyler, Andrew flips on a nearby table lamp to examine a piece of paper. Michael notices the light from the lamp's UV bulb reveals numbers painted on the mask from earlier. They enter the combination to the safe and collect key number one. Right off the bat, there's another huge red flag. No emergency exits. All real escape rooms have one, and there's no way a local fire marshal would allow a business to actually lock its customers inside without a way for them to readily let themselves out. The fact that there is no fire exit means we're dealing with a pretty disreputable operation at best, and honestly, that'd be all the excuse I would need to give the safe word. Tyler's experience with a mask would be pretty frightening, sure, but it could possibly be be explained as some kind of holographic film covering the ice lots. That'd be pretty easy to verify by poking out the film or having one of the others take a look through the mask to see if they see the worms too. If they don't, it's pretty reasonable to assume that the tea was spiked with a hallucinogenic and everyone needs to be shouting awake. It's not too far-fetched considering this establishment hasn't even remotely been following the law. And one of the escapees mentioned seeing a reference to hallucinogenics, which might have been inappropriately included for its relevance to the game's theme. As we find out soon, the safe word doesn't abort the game. The game operators are clearly not playing fairly and not taking their guest safety seriously, meaning searching for the keys as a way to escape is probably a dead end. Literally. Their only real option is to circumvent the game somehow, like brute forcing their way out by popping door hinges and knocking down the starting room door with anything they can find. The next room has a bunch of old clocks and much better lighting. Another buzz calls everyone's attention to the game timer, showing that they still have 50 minutes to finish the remaining rooms. In the center of the room is a strange device the inventor supposedly used to try to communicate with the dead. Melanie picks up the handset and attempts to make contact with whomever might be on the other side. At first, she thinks it's just a gag that replays whatever she says back to her, but then she hears someone talking freely in her own voice, and they want to speak with Tyler. Tyler begrudgingly takes the phone from Melanie. Her voice is still coming through the line, apologizing profusely and begging him to leave the house. Suddenly, Karen sees what looks like blood on Tyler's ear. He turns the phone to find a writhing mass of bloody worms clinging to the earpiece before tossing it away in equal parts horror and disgust. The handset breaks apart, revealing more fake blood inside, but there's no sign of any worms like Tyler claims. Once again, he's certain he saw something no one else did, but this time he won't back down. Having had his fill of freaky shit, Tyler decides to call it quits and screams awake until the previous door finally opens to let him out. Melanie tries to go after him, but the door slams shut right in front of her, either unconvinced or unconcerned by the look of sheer terror on her boyfriend's face, Melanie decides to go on without him. The others aren't so sure, as Tyler's panic seems sincere. Andrew suggests that maybe the host spiked the tea that they were given before the introduction, citing that they have no idea what they agreed to in the waiver they blindly signed. Melanie won't have it. She's determined to get another escape room under her belt and convinces the remaining participants to press onward, despite the strange occurrences. This could all be explained as just a trick by a real escape room operator, such as using voice modulators to sound like Melanie, or hidden mechanisms on the phone could open to release fake blood and or worms. And if this is too much for Tyler, he shouldn't be playing the game and has every right to want to leave. Honestly, Tyler made the entirely reasonable choice to bail with the safe word after his hallucinogenic experience. This is exactly why you don't drink unknown substances shady businesses are handing out, or sign agreements without reading and fully understanding what you're agreeing to. While Tyler's freakout seems sincere and their suspicion of Josie spiking the tea is 
is a giant red flag, the federal level drug trafficking type of red flag. Nobody has any reason to suspect anything truly sinister yet, and everyone's too wrapped up in the game's thick atmosphere to realize that they're waltzing deeper into the trap. Michael discovers that the keys on a nearby typewriter have been rearranged. Melanie determines it must be a cipher, so now they just need to figure out what to type in. Karen then notices one of the clocks is stopped at 10:12. Seeing the radio in the room, Melanie suggests that it must correspond to a specific station. They tune the dial to 101.2, and a man's voice begins reading off a random series of letters. When punched into the cipher, the input returns five lost from midnight. It seems like a stumper at first, but Karen figures it out. She turns the hands on the broken clock to read 11:55, and a key drops from below the face. Instead of unlocking the next escape room, the second key opens the door to a nearby closet. Karen starts digging through the piled up clothing on the floor and finds something wet. Suddenly, a hand reaches out from under a blanket and grabs her by the arm. The hand belongs to Josie, who seems to be suffering from a stab wound to her abdomen. As she bleeds out on the floor, she weakly warns everyone, the inventor is here, and that if they don't escape the house before their hour is up, they'll be trapped inside forever. She tells them they need to find the master key, and then the closet door slams shut on its own, locking her inside. While Andrew, Michael, and Karen are all shocked by what they just saw, Melanie shrugs it off as just another part of the game. Despite her protests, Michael decides he's had enough and shouts the safe word at one of the other doors. There's no response. Michael asks Melanie if it's common for escape rooms to just ignore the safe word and leave their participants trapped. Andrew brings up the fact that Tyler was allowed to leave, but Michael questions whether he actually made it out at all. Karen sides with Melanie and suggests that perhaps the doors aren't opening because Josie had to return to the front desk. She adds that it's quite a coincidence the closet door slammed shut before they could verify her condition. Either Josie's death was staged or she's really committed to staying in character. If it were real, why didn't she say something along the lines of, I just got stabbed, call a freaking ambulance. I suppose she could have been delirious from blood loss, but still, her exclaiming the inventor is here is exactly what one would expect her to say if it were just part of the game. I would have smelled the spot on my hand where Josie grabbed me. Blood is a distinctive metallic odor that fake blood typically doesn't emulate. This would be a simple way to tell if she was really injured. If it's real, however, not only could someone end up dying, but whoever attacked them may be after one of us next. I would get someone to help me drag Josie out of the closet, where we had more room to take care of her, and so the doors don't remotely shut on us like they have been. I'd then apply pressure to her wounds with clothes, while asking what happened to her, how we can avoid a similar fate, what master key, where is it, which room, where she put the phones, how to raise the window plates, and if there's a false back to the closet. With how into character she seems to be, she could try faking her death, in which case you'd want to check her pulse to ensure this isn't an insanely elaborate, borderline psychotic prank. Like Karen said, it's awfully convenient the door would shut before they could investigate further. That said, there's a lot of automated contraptions in the house, so it really could be a coincidence it happened to shut at that time. Real blood or not, the safe word not working is a clear sign something is wrong. Given the level of automation we've seen in the house so far, it's not like Josie would have to physically be touching the door to open it. Even if it's just some kind of malfunction, that doesn't change the fact that we're trapped inside. At this point, I'd start breaking apart the lamps and furniture to fashion tools I could use to bust through the doors and or drywall. We'd find out pretty quickly whether it was all a hoax if Josie came out running to stop us from destroying her meal ticket. Plus, if there's really a murderer on the loose, it couldn't hurt to have something we could use to defend ourselves. Will it ultimately matter? It's hard to tell. The group decides to continue playing the game. Meanwhile, the timer on the wall buzzes again, showing that they only have 40 minutes to reach the end. With the last key only working on the closet door, they decide they need to think of another way to exit the current room. Andrew spots a small window above one of the locked doors, but he doesn't think it's large enough for anyone to make it through. Karen confidently claims that she can fit, and volunteers as tribute. I agree with the decision to ignore keys and find another way out. Maybe it's the forced perspective, but it looks to me like just about any of them could have squeezed through the window. At the very least, Melanie could have gone too. She's barely any bigger than Karen, and who knows if there's puzzles on the other side that require more than one person to complete. Besides, if we're still not 100% sure someone wasn't just stabbed to death and left in the closet to die, we probably shouldn't be sending anyone anywhere alone, least of all a defenseless, gullible teenage girl. I would have dragged some of the furniture over to the door and tried sending everyone through the window. If it were really too small for anyone else to climb through, I'd probably hold off on that option until we've literally tried everything else, or at least put a desk in front of it to stand on and help her back out if someone else was there. Once on the other side, Karen is still unable to open the door, leading back to the others. She tries peeking through the 
privacy window on one of the other doors when suddenly a hand comes slamming into the glass, sending her screaming back down the hall. Just then, a shadowy figure carrying a lantern walks down an intersecting hallway and beckons Karen to follow her. Assuming it's just the hostess, Karen tells the rest of the group Josie's okay before following her into the darkness. Seeing no other way out of the room, Michael and Andrew pick up a grandfather clock and use it like a battering ram to try and break down the door. Meanwhile, Josie's ghostly, otherworldly whispering leads Karen down into a pitch black basement. As soon as she walks in, the door slams shut behind her, setting off a chain reaction of turning gears that unlocks the door for the rest of the group. Even if you thought that was really Josie walking down the hall, her behavior is not normal, especially the weird, creepy whispering she's clearly using to bait Karen away from her group and into a vulnerable, isolated area. The proverbial evil jelly bean trail strikes again. Now would be a great time to climb back into the room where there's safety in numbers. There is no way in hell I'd be following her tauntings with a murder on the loose, let alone going into that basement. Game or not, it looks like something out of Saw. Also, given that we've seen doors slam shut on their own, it's painfully stupid to not be jamming up the path of every door we come across. Even a balled up sweatshirt should be enough to hold it ajar. The moment they use the grandfather clock to attempt to bash down the door, and Josie doesn't come barreling in freaking out about property damage, they should acknowledge that she didn't fake her death, and that they're in real danger and need to GTFO. There doesn't appear to be a traditional locking mechanism on this door, suggesting a top and bottom facing deadbolt, or worse. The door could be steel lined like a vault, which again means their only chance is to ensure that open doors remain open with jams. Tearing through the walls instead would likely reveal all the cogs and gears lining every room of the house, which in turn would reveal that the house could be reacting to their every move. In short, save for a crack in the castle wall or playing the game, they're screwed. While Michael, Melanie, and Andrew move to catch up, Karen fearfully explores her surroundings in search of Josie. She appears to be trapped in some kind of DIY mortuary. After making her way over to the sink, Karen spots a small key lying near the drain, but realizes it's actually one of Josie's earrings. As she turns away, she notices the four adjacent drawer coolers seem to have opened by themselves. The lights flicker and suddenly one of the coolers is open, and it's no longer empty. Slowly, Karen approaches the shrouded figure protruding from the drawer. She pulls back the cover, revealing a gnarled human body draped across the slab. Terrified by what she sees, Karen turns away from the rotting corpse until she hears the drawer shut once again. Her relief is short-lived, as a low guttural growl begins emanating from the adjoining room. Careful not to make any noise, Karen quietly creeps over to the morgue entrance and shuts the door. Almost immediately, the growling intensifies, and something heavy slams into the flimsy wooden planks. Karen climbs into one of the empty coolers, shutting the drawer just as the door swings open. I don't care if it's an earring, a toe ring, or an onion ring. If it looks like a key, I'm putting it in my pocket for later. It's at least worth trying on a lock if we get stuck. Again, everything we've seen indicates that continuing to play the game is the worst option. In the back of the morgue, there's a breakable window with bars spaced far enough apart that Karen might be able to slip through. Hiding in the cadaver cabinet was probably the best move given the circumstances. I'm guessing whatever was making that growling noise wasn't too friendly, so I would have brought something in there with me I could use as a weapon if it came down to it. Looks like there's plenty of sharp objects in there we could grab, like scalpels or surgical scissors. The cadaver cabinet seemed to be hollow. Karen could climb down to the lower level and hide underneath the top tray, or sneak over to the opposite side the creature was loudly moving towards. Back upstairs, the rest of the group notices a ray of light spilling through the keyhole on one of the doors. After Michael waves his hand in front of the opening, the door unlocks and creaks open slightly. Inside, they find a twisting maze of hanging sheets and a running film projector. The game timer buzzes once again, showing that they only have 35 minutes left to play. Further investigation reveals a combination lock on a desk drawer and a couple reels of film for the projector. Melanie slaps in one of the reels, but it's more the same weird crap from Josie's introduction video. The group then turns their attention to a ceiling fan spinning overhead. Andrew, displaying some oddly niche knowledge, suggests using the flickering light of the projector to make the fan blades appear motionless. The machine is bolted down, but fortunately there's a small mirror conveniently stashed nearby. Bouncing the light off the mirror reveals a combination painted on the fan. Michael dials it into the lock and opens the drawer to find key number three. He and Andrew waste no time leaving the room, but Melanie stays behind, mesmerized by what she sees projected on the screen. It looks like her, walking in a loop through the maze of dangling white sheets. The door to the room shuts and she's cut off from the rest of them. Right now, the priority is looking for Karen, and Tyler, though he's probably dead. We should have just called her name when the door opened, instead of barging into another room 
we could potentially become locked inside of. If we didn't have a reason to believe that she was in there, we should have moved on and come back later once we'd checked everywhere else. When the group walked up the stairs initially, there was a set of doors that had exposed hinges and what appeared to be glass with thin pieces of wood separating them. Karen might have gotten locked behind that door for all they know. They could at least try breaking in to check. More evidence that the house is reacting to their moves is the door opening based on motion activation. That or a puppeteer is watching them on camera. This makes me feel like the game is far more involved to only take 60 minutes to complete. Andrew's mirror trick is cute, but they could also just shove a pull in the fan blades. Or skip this whole thing and climb up the ladder that has natural light pouring out of it. After they collected the key, Melanie should have known better than to let herself be separated from the rest of the group. Likewise, Michael and Andrew should have stuck around for a second to make sure she was following them. The house is clearly set up to cut people off from one another, and we need to keep everyone together to have the best shot at solving all the puzzles, or defending ourselves from the murderer before the time runs out. They can't be too surprised when the door shuts and locks itself. Why would they expect anything different at this point? Once again, this is a clear example of why they should be using the plentiful junk strewn about the house to jam up every door they come across. Melanie's confusion only worsens as she tries to navigate the linen maze, with every turn leading her right back to the projector. At first, she's impressed with the intricacy of the illusion, but her excitement quickly turns to panic as she becomes desperate to find her way back to Michael and Andrew, who are too busy hurling accusations at each other to try to find a way back to her. Just as she begins to call out for help, Melanie rounds another corner to find Tyler stiff as a board, dangling from the ceiling with a noose around his neck. Her screams of terror quickly cut short by the sound of a phone ringing back at the projector. Though hesitant at first, Melanie answers, only to realize she's talking to herself from earlier in the game. Just like before, she asks to speak with Tyler, warning him to leave the house as soon as possible. Hmm, I wonder how that'll turn out. The line goes dead and she finds herself surrounded by dark shadows with clawed hands cast against the hanging sheets. As more and more of the shadowy figures begin to manifest, Melanie backs into a ladder leading up to an open hatch. Halfway to salvation, one of the rungs breaks under her foot, sending her tumbling down to the desk below, where an upright scalpel is waiting to puncture the back of her skull. Once I discover that walking in one direction would mysteriously teleport me to the other side of the room, besides having an out-of-body crisis at the thought of teleporting and how totally out of depth I am, try walking around the doorframe. The teleportation seems to be localized to a specific doorframe, so other avenues may circumvent the portal. I would also have torn down the sheets, creating the maze to make the room easier to navigate and prevent someone from sneaking up on me. I'm a little surprised she didn't check to see if Tyler was still alive. Granted, he probably wasn't, but hanging can take a while to kill someone depending on the circumstances. After discovering Tyler's death was likely the result of him breaking off from the rest of the group, why would you still tell him to leave the house like that? You literally know exactly what will happen if he does. Most people will look back on a tragedy like this and wish they could have done something differently. Instead, Melanie sets Tyler up to die in the exact same way. I would have told him to stay with the group, or better yet, just said nothing once I realized I was on the other end of the phone call from earlier. Once Melanie became surrounded by the shadowy figures, the latter was probably her only viable means of escape. There was no way to anticipate the rung would break like that, but she could have at least tried to hold on to the top rungs so she didn't fall uncontrolled. Down in the basement, things have not been going so great for Karen. Not only was she crammed inside a corpse cooler, but the body on the slab beside her seems to have a little life left in it. Still trapped by whatever was prowling around the mortuary, she quietly cries awake in hopes of ending her living nightmare. The door of the cooler swings open, but fortunately it's Andrew. He helps Karen down from her hiding spot, just as the only exit, yet again, shuts and locks them in the morgue. Karen becomes suspicious of the fact that Andrew showed up by himself and somehow knew exactly where she was. He claims that he and Michael split up to find her and that he heard her screams. Sensing her concern, he reassures her that this is all just a twisted game that's gotten out of hand. Karen reluctantly agrees to team up again and remembers that Josie told them that there were five townspeople they needed to help escape, which she connects to there being five of them at the start of the game. She suggests that they must have unwittingly signed up for some kind of bizarre experiment, but Andrew doesn't care. Game or not, they need to find a way to escape the basement. For the love of God, jam the doors. I definitely wouldn't trust Andrew. Despite how stupid her team has been so far, it's unlikely Michael agreed to intentionally split up. Karen also was not screaming when he arrived, which begs the question, how did he find her? Thinking back, Karen did scream in the morgue, but it was when she first heard a noise at the entrance. Andrew may have been the one making noises earlier with some sort of voice modulator. I wouldn't make this fact known though, as it could provoke him if he 
was a plant, or if he wasn't, it only make teamwork more difficult. As Marine Corps General James Mad Dog Mattis said, be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everybody you meet. I'd slip a scalpel into my back pocket and keep an eye on it. The two go to work, searching for any clues that might lead them to the next key. Karen begins thumbing through a dusty old folder, finding a diagram of a woman's body with arrows pointing to her abdomen, and the words for an object removed from the stomach. At the same time, Andrew stumbles upon a heavy metal grate sealed by a padlock. He then spots a small key in the bottom of the sink, but Karen tells him it's just an earring. A slip of paper sticking out from behind one of the anatomical drawings on the wall turns out to be a map of the basement. Karen finds another exit marked in the same spot as a filthy backed up toilet. Realizing it's par for the course at this point, Andrew rolls up his sleeve and goes in wrist deep. After feeling around for a moment, he thinks he's found something, pulling out the mushy remains of a severed human hand. Somehow managing not to vomit, Karen decides to give it a go herself. She throws the hand out of the way and soon enough, she's found the fourth key. The two triumphantly unlock the grate and Karen leads the way inside. The walls begin to narrow and claustrophobia brings her to a dead stop. Andrew does his best to take her mind off of her surroundings, suggesting she thinks about something fun to do, like horseback riding. He gets halfway through the setup of a two guys walk into a bar joke when something grabs him from behind, pulling him back into the darkness to not be seen again. What's the harm in at least trying the key from the bottom of the sink? Best case scenario, you avoid having to dig through all that nasty water. Worst case, you're back to where you started. Given that it's a mortuary, I would have maybe looked around for some rubber gloves before rooting around in the filthy toilet. Once they got the lock off the grate, I'd go first and ensure that we lock the gate behind us so nothing could follow. Andrew's still the primary threat. By going first with a sharp object in hand, if he attacked us, we could kick him in the head or cut his neck. By being in the back, he could just stomp our heads in or block the exit. One thing's for sure, I would have wasted no time crawling through that duct. While Andrew and Karen were busy digging around in raw sewage, Michael was wandering aimlessly through the house in pursuit of his missing daughter. His search takes him to a set of muddy footprints leading to a nearby painting. For some reason, Michael becomes transfixed by the image, completely losing himself in the landscape. The walls of the house collapse around him and he finds himself standing at the edge of the water. A pale woman rises from the water and starts walking towards him, a rusted chain paying out in pace with her steps. When they meet face to face, she puts her arm around his shoulders. As she kisses away at his neck, Michael notices a large rotating sprocket has emerged from the water behind her. In an instant, the woman is gone, replaced by chains wrapping around his entire body. The bindings then begin to tighten around his neck, squeezing the life out of him and forcing him onto the ground. Michael keels over backwards, somehow transported back to the house. He catches his breath and rises to his feet before noticing something different about the painting, where once there was nothing in the middle of the water, now stands Josie holding a lantern. Michael looks down and discovers his shoes are caked in fresh mud. He staggers away from the mysterious painting before it can send him on another blind date. I don't think Michael could have predicted getting sucked into a painting like Super Mario 64. It's hard to say whether he had any control over his behavior at this time, but we do see him looking around and moving towards the water. If I could help it, I would not have let the strange woman anywhere near me. My first thought would be her trying to drag us both back into the creek, especially with the chains leading towards her. Ultimately, it was just some kind of vivid hallucination. Although that doesn't explain the mud all over Michael's shoes after the fact, one thing's for sure. I'd stay the hell away from any other pieces of artwork I came across in the house, and probably just in general going forward. At this point, Michael's stumbling around like Jack from The Shining. He frantically beats on every door he can find until one finally gives way. Just then, he hears Karen screaming at the sight of Andrew being dragged off into oblivion. Michael follows the screaming back to the white linen maze where he finds Tyler hanging around. At the same time, Karen kicks her way out of a nearby grate, screaming in horror as she stumbles upon Melanie's body. Finally reunited, Michael and Karen realize the only way out of this nightmare is to complete the remaining escape rooms as originally intended. Overhead, the buzzing game clock glitches back and forth, between 9 and 36 minutes remaining. They find the desk under the projector has locked itself back up with the same combination job as before. Rather than waste time screwing around with a flickering projector, Michael jams a metal pipe in the ceiling fan to bring it to a stop. He retrieves the key from the drawer once again, and the two of them make their way through a bookcase back to the very first room. The game clock is now flipping between 5 and 45 minutes remaining. Suddenly, Tyler busts in through another door screaming awake, just like before. Karen yells at him to stop, and for a moment he does, but it seems he's unable to actually see the two of them standing just 10 feet away. Confused, Tyler looks around the room for the source of her commands, but before she can tell him anything that might prevent his fate, a shadow figure emerges from a nearby door and drags him off into darkness. Michael's dumbfounded by the sight of Tyler still alive after 
after seeing him dead only minutes ago. Karen then comes to the conclusion that Josie, the house, and everything inside it are caught in some kind of time loop, or echo as she puts it. They decide they'll have to go back to where they found Josie before in order to retrieve the master key and escape. I don't think they could have done anything to keep Tyler from getting got by the shadow thing. He couldn't see them, so anything else they might have said to him would have probably just terrified and confused him even more. Good on Karen for putting two and two together. As far out as it is, it's hard to think of another explanation that doesn't involve collective hallucination or being trapped in some kind of nightmare. After blowing past the first puzzle, Michael and Karen make their way to the second room with all the clocks. Remembering the process from earlier, they turn the hands on the grandfather clock to 11.55, but for some reason it won't give up the key to the closet. Karen struggles to think of what could have changed, but Michael realizes it's they who have changed, there being only two of them now instead of the original five. They dial the clock to 11.58, and the second key drops down just like before. The two return to the closet to find Josie bleeding out all over again. She repeats the same line about finding the master key, but it's nowhere to be found. Karen remembers the autopsy drawing she found in the basement and suggests the key might be lodged in Josie's stomach. Michael reaches into the wound on Josie's abdomen and digs out the master key. The two make it back to the center of the room as all hell breaks loose around them. Just as the mysterious shadow man enters the room, Karen spots a prominently featured door that looks like an exit. The master key does its job, and the door swings open to reveal the truck stop bathroom. I guess it's safe to say Josie wasn't faking. Either that or she was so committed to the role she'd rather be violently disemboweled than break character. They're pretty lucky to have guessed the right door out of all the others in the room. Michael was just a few seconds away from winding up worm food to the hands of whatever was sneaking up behind him. Michael and Karen are perplexed by the drastic change in scenery, with Karen remarking that she's been here before. They hear a sound of someone approaching, prompting them to duck inside a nearby stall. It's Karen, or rather a version of her that hadn't yet acquired a deep burning hatred for escape rooms. While past Karen checks herself out in the mirror, present Karen backs into the nearby wall, accidentally dropping the same coin she heard in the very beginning. Fortunately, Betsy's still around to prevent them from creating a time paradox. Having avoided a quantum catastrophe, Michael and Karen carefully walk out of the restroom back into the diner. Everything appears to be exactly as they left it, right down to the partially eaten plates of food where they were sitting. After exiting to the parking lot, Karen notices their car is still waiting for them. The mechanic left a note saying there won't be any charges, and the keys are inside. Michael and Karen eagerly jump into the vehicle and start searching for the keys, but before they can ride off into the sunset, Karen calls her dad's attention to the glove box. It looks like the game's not over. The movie ends. It's hard to say what would have happened if past Karen would have opened the stall door. After all, if past Tyler couldn't see them, why would it be any different for her? After leaving the bathroom, I would have tried talking to someone in the diner to make sure they could see us. If we were still invisible to the other people, it would be a clear indication that we were still under the influence of the inventor's house. Michael should be especially sensitive to this possibility after what he went through with the woman in the painting. We know from his experience that it's possible for the house to transport us somewhere outside its walls, be it a hallucination or otherwise. The situation surrounding their car is weird. The fact that they took a cab to the escape house earlier means it was probably still being worked on when they left, so it must just be the inventor setting them up for more torment with the newly added locks. With the way Betsy was acting at the diner, and with a mechanic being responsible for the car, it could be the whole town is aware of and possibly supporting the supernatural happenings for one reason or another. Best to stay far away from that town if possible. Once out of town, I'd be reporting the murders and finding any possible way to get the escape room location shut down or demolished to prevent others from entering and having the same experience I had, and to prevent further deaths like the others may have experienced. In the end, it's hard to say what, if anything, they could have done differently to change their inevitable fate, besides simply not going to the escape room in the first place. Even if they could have saved the lives of the other players, they'd all still be prisoners of the inventor's house, which might actually be worse than being dead. What bothers me is I still can't figure out exactly when they reached the point of no return. Could they have still left the house after starting the first room, or were they doomed the moment they walked into the diner? Let me know what you think in the comments. Ultimately, I think the inventor's house from No Escape Room was unbeaten. Thanks for watching, and remember, just tell them Betsy sent you.